look, I don't know how else to put it, but it might be time to consider that we're more nervous than the players are. This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, the Inter- Gunner. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this. I was so nervous for this game, as I have been, I guess, for every game, since I've started to realize that this thing may happen, that it could happen. And then every time... The, the players rock up somewhere. They don't seem nervous. They're, they're like, we, ha- we got this, actually. I sometimes think we're more nervous about it than they are, and it's a theme that I kind of want to talk about, actually, throughout this episode because we are seeing the evolution of this team, not just to being a talented team that can win in different ways, but a team that can master their emotions and master the moment. And from a team that got slated for being too emotional last season, now there is just a steely determination about them that is – Uh, breathtaking to behold and a fixture that could be quite difficult a Brighton team that had not lost since the summer since August at the Amex just taken to pieces taken apart Arsenal took a few minutes to come to terms with what Brighton do and when they did come to terms with it eventually blew them off the pitch a a dominating performance on the scoreline 3-0 a dominating performance in XG by the way over three expected goals for Arsenal less than half an expected goal for Brighton we've now scored 30 conceded four this calendar year and I hope you take a moment to to stop and consider the historic run. I, I really do because the hardest thing, and, and I, I say it not like I'm going to be able to do, do it, so let's be honest, that we should try to enjoy each of these little incremental moments so that we don't just get so nervous and so caught up in the run-in that we don't appreciate how historic this run is. So we're going to talk about the Brighton game, the Kai Havertz, and all the other aspects of it. Then we'll shift gears and look ahead to Bayern Munich, because obviously that comes on Tuesday. What we will not do is talk about United Liverpool because we're recording before United Liverpool, but I can see the future and I can tell you that it was, while painful to see Liverpool pick up points, hilarious to see United taken apart that way at Old Trafford. Okay, here with me now to discuss uh, all things Arsenal is Paul, you can find him on Twitter, pause my pants, hello, pause. Woohoo! And Clive, you can find him on Twitter, Clive PFC, hello, Clive. Hello, hello. A couple things to note, if my uh, voice sounds a little different, I am officially on my first vacation, like proper true vacation with just my wife and I for the last a little over four years. So this is day one of the vacation, which means the first thing I've got to do is record a podcast, obviously. Um, but it also means that things are going to be a little different. So like on YouTube, there's not going to be video. We don't have the ability to do video from here. This week, you're going to get instant reactions on Patreon. You're going to get other Patreon pods. You're going to get the main pod. But um, I am probably not going to be on any of the pods this week. I will watch the Bayern game. Come hell or high water, I will find a way to do it. Um, But very unlikely to be able to podcast about it. So you'll be in good hands with the guys this week, not myself. However, um, I do have uh, just enough podcasting left in me to say, look, we are very, very close now to being able to hit our goal again with the fundraiser. I keep saying it, but the outpouring of support for it surprises me every time because I always have that worry. What, what if it doesn't resonate? Once again, cannot thank you enough. If you haven't listened to the Leah Williamson interview, I, I hope you will. A reminder, we now have a 150,000 pound pledge to the fundraiser to match every pound that you are giving. So if you can give five, you're giving 10. If you can give 10, you're giving 20. If you can give 1,472, you are giving 2,944, I think. I don't know. I should have made that one easier for myself. I was told there'd be no math. Anyway, um, just giving forward slash page forward slash AVP. We love you for doing it more than anything. Children who love Arsenal and love what you're doing um, in the Zattery camp appreciate it more than more than my words can ever communicate. So please do that. Okay, uh, enough of that. Let's dive right into it. Clive, um, I don't think we have to go big on the lineup. Um, Saka comes back, Jesus playing on the left wing, and I I think that's more to just keep Martinelli in cold storage, ready to absolutely run his feet through the ground against Bayern on Tuesday. Jorginho comes back in, Zinchenko comes back in. Looks a little bit like what you could consider almost a first 11, you know, maybe minus Martinelli. And I want to talk about the first stage of the game, maybe the first 10 minutes or so. Brighton are a very good team. They play excellent football under De Zerbe. They press well. They can counter well. They play through well. And I thought it was so interesting in that first 10 minutes or first 15 minutes to watch Arsenal like a like an AI learning on the pitch what the challenge was going to be, adapting to it, and slowly taking control of the game from there. So what did you think of that initial stage and what Brighton do and how we figured out sort of how to counter that and impose our football on them? 
Yeah, it's impossible not to, well, for me, to over-index every time Brighton played out. We haven't seen anybody play out and run through our team for a long yeah. time, it feels like, right? So suddenly, I, on my TV, I can see all this grass and Arsenal players running through it with their heads nodding. <laughs> I'm thinking, hold on, mate, <laughs> can we catch them up? <laughs> and so it was a definite sprint back game. There's some interesting things we did on the, on the recovery. So, and we kept doing it, right? We kept going in. and I, I've, I've only had a chance to watch the first sort of 35 minutes this morning. I'm trying to see what they did to get out. They, they're obviously smart to get out. They bring their centre backs in. But a couple of times, I thought Lamptey and Estepunian were very smart in their movement, how they moved around people and behind people and ran inside. Similar, Estepunian in particular ran behind Saka once. And it was beautiful running line. And he got the ball on the run, on the angle, and then just ran through. Um, I think Havas got back in there on that occasion. And Lamptey got out a couple of times. And it, it felt a bit unnerving. You know, and our Twitter timeline was was unnerved, and I suppose that's their that's their superpower more so than pressing. It's playing out, and I just hadn't seen the pitch look so big. And fair play to them on that. So when you're watching nil nil on your Saturday night and you're sitting there after Man City have won, every one of those things are like uh, the end of the world moment. It feels like you know. And um, when I watched it this morning, <laughs> relax, nice and easy. We'll catch them. <laughs> we'll stop them. <laughs> Uh, every one of those defenders, brilliant. They're all fantastic, right? But um, we all go through it, don't we? So, fair play to them. I thought they played out nicely. And it was interesting to see what we did. And I sometimes think, what did we do? Or did we just become a bit more aggressive where we needed to be and put their touches under a bit more pressure? I felt, if anything, Elliot, what we were doing wrong in the first 10 minutes or so was some of our first touches were off. And so we couldn't quite chin them back after about minute 10, 15, we had a number of chances in a row and that's when we found our feet and then uh, it was pretty good from there on in. Yeah, I I think the nervousness that we feel now about every result is definitely going to influence our reaction in real time. And then you have to stop yourself and think back, strip away that emotion. I, I had a a very unfortunate situation, which is my flight was exactly during this game. And just before anybody says, how can you schedule a vacation during this week? It was scheduled like a year ago. I rolled the dice and (laughs) I lost whatever the number it's supposed to come up. It didn't come up that number, but literally this flight was during the game. Very, very unnerving situation to come off airplane mode. There was no Wi-Fi on the flight and literally find out the score five minutes after full time. But to watch it without the emotion and know what the score is, to your point, Clive, You can really see the team figuring things out. Now, it should be mentioned, by the way, we could have been ahead in whatever that was, the first minute or so. Um, Set piece, I think it was Odegaard with delivery, right? And Gabriel heads just wide. And and it looks like it's flying in, but just misses it. I mean, the set piece and and corner kick weapon that we have this season is just a totally different way for us to be able to to change a game. But, Paul, let's let's start to talk about the dominance. And before we get to Kai Havertz, because I want to do a, a big section on him and a, a very interesting comment Mikel made about him at center forward. Where do you think we then started to take control of the game and started to find the ways to not just counter what they do, but nullify what they do and impose our game on them? Who, who were the players and what were the key components of the way we did that? Yeah, so my, un, my uneducated guess on this is that... You know, Brighton have this superpower and we accepted it. Mikel accepted it. They were going to be able to play out from time to time uh, quite successfully. It's what they do. Um, I think there's you, you saw tremendous respect between the managers before the game. I think this is just De Zerbe's thing. And we decided to accept it, live with it, maybe even lean into it. And so it took us took us seven, eight, nine, ten minutes to get our claws into them. But then, yeah, they got out a few times and we lived with it. And I think we had a couple of measures to to kind of cover ourselves with that. I think, uh, you know, Gabriel Jesus was super attentive to cutting into midfield if they got through us through the center. I think Rice uh, cheated quite a lot to the left-hand side to cover with Zinchenko um Havertz made sure to be available to get back wherever possible. And I think we just said, okay, we'll live with that. We're not going to change how we play. In fact, we're going to lean into our aggressive pressing, our attacking their back line. Sometimes they'll get away from us and 
will cope. And I think in large part we did. I mean, they really didn't get into our box. The The shots they had on target were from distance. Um, and we decided to roll those dice a little bit to keep it an open game. And I think our aggressive pressing, you know, the 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 turnovers, we just accepted that game. Um, we created lots of good situations. Um, I, was, I was a little nervous, but I still thought we were going to do it. And I think from about 10, 12 minutes onwards, I think... We like it wasn't until we got the goal where you, you kind of settled into okay, this is really going to be okay. But I did kind of feel the tide had turned after about ten minutes, and we were getting better situations than they were. We weren't finish them, finishing them off at that point. Uh, I think we just lived with it, um, and I think there was an a very important decision made in terms of the lineup. I know we weren't going to talk about lineups, and when we get to the Bayern section, I have a very strong view that actually the manager made a key decision that's going to live with us for a little while and it, it's going to be big on our approach. And it's yeah. Gabriel Jesus. It's so funny you said that, Paul, because I, I do think with Gabriel Jesus, the thing that you have to respect, right? Forget whether he's a cent, he's a, he should be our starting striker or he's not, or he is, or he finishes enough, or he doesn't take his chances. And like, I thought the one that he stung the palms of the keeper was really well taken. I thought the header back across goal was not well taken. Obviously, he wins a penalty. But to have a player that level who can play for Sack if he doesn't play and can play for Martinelli if he doesn't play and can play through the middle, you know, all right, I get it. Maybe we're in phase five now or phase four or phase three and a half or whatever Mikel says the phase is. Last summer, he was bought to start at striker for us. Okay, the knee injury wasn't part of the plan. He did it well. But maybe the plan, you know, has been updated now where he becomes for us what he was for City. The iron is the irony is he came to Arsenal to get away from being the trusted utility player who plays here and there and occasionally to come to Arsenal and star with a number nine on his back but maybe he just really fits that star utility player role where he can play all across the front three in any game the manager picks him and keep the level high, and he did that in this game. Quickly on the penalty, um, this is where watching not live is funny. I don't know why there's a debate. Maybe the debate is because Lee Dixon apparently on commentary was spent 15 minutes saying it wasn't a penalty, but Clive, just super quick, that is a stonewall penalty, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's more. Like, it's, the it's more. It's more of a penalty than not a penalty because people have their football structures and they see things. Some people think if you get a touch on the ball, anything that happens after that, it's fair dues. <laughs> and so we've seen situations where people have won the ball but cleared people out afterwards and been sent off. So that's not. That's not true. The good thing about this one was when Jesus dinked it over his foot, he got a slight touch on the ball. But the ball was in plain distance for Jesus to get on it in the end, and again to keep possession, mm. and he couldn't keep possession because he was taken out. So that's the foul. Ooh, mm. My watch is just talking to me. Uh, that's the yeah, foul, right? So twenty twenty four, and so and so that's it. There's no debate there. You can say, well, he touched it. It doesn't matter. The guy had an intention to get past him. He had the ball was there in his in his circumference, and he was taken out. So. In the discussion, really, I thought the referee was was good to um to because you know another thing that we forget sometimes as uh, people watching on TV, referees have something that we don't have. They can hear the contact. They can literally hear it when someone kicks. And for those who played, you know what I mean. You can hear it; it's like obvious. Mm. And he pointed to the spot very very quickly, and then they probably went to VAR. The first thing they probably went to VAR for, for to check it was actually inside the box. That's perfect use of VAR. Do you see what I mean? Make sure it's inside the box. And then the secondary reason is to say, or make sure there's no offside as well, by the way. And the secondary reason is to make sure that, you know, was there anything egregious about my decision that makes you think I should turn it around? And, and there was significant contact. So, therein, I think the discussion ends. But if, if someone's got a different view, please, please shout, right? No, I, I mean, no one on this pod, I would imagine, has a different view. Paul, I don't want to spend a lot of time analyzing what, for me, is a clear penalty, but you did the little hand raise thing in the studio that we used to record. So <laughs> what would you like to add to this? <laughs> I would like to add nothing to is it a penalty or not, because I think that distracts from the much bigger topic for us, which is it's kind of a little bit brilliant by Gabriel Jesus. 
Uh, Lamptey's not in a great spot, but he's outside the box when he's tracking back. And Jesus just has this wily fox experience. Like, I don't think, I love Martinelli. I don't think he does that. I think he takes the ball and he tries to dribble around or cut back to Lamptey or take it to the byline. Jesus says, oi, oi, I've been a few, here a few times. I'm going to get this ball as fast as I can into the box so that I give Lamptey a choice and I'm going to cut back, flick it over his leg like I've done a thousand times. And let's just see what happens here. He sprints into the box so that Lamptey has to take his path into the box and Lamptey comes flying. He, Lamptey is trying to get there before Jesus gets to the box. I think it's pure craft from his side. Foxy craft. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's really good craft and guile to, to win the penalty. It's definitely a penalty for me. Um, and, and then you have Bukayo Saka, you know, he was interviewed after the match, said he's carrying an injury, but he said, you couldn't keep me away from playing this game. Um, you know, he talked about his confidence stepping up to take the penalty. We know there was a a penalty miss last season that was hurtful. He's scored a penalty in a shootout to keep us in the champions league. He scores this penalty here. And Clive, I think with Bukayo Saka, it, it is going to be a case of how much can he give us down the stretch and managing him. But as you've always said about him, whether it's his best game or not his best game, whether he's at his absolute peak or not his absolute peak, he has a knack for doing the critical thing that sends us on our way. And, you know, he has to score this penalty for this to wind up being a 3-0 comfortable, confident, dominant win. He does it, and and that does wind up sending us on our way. So maybe just a a thought on the wide player situation and on Bukayo Saka managing his way through the end of the season with whatever injuries he's carrying because he is such an important leader on the pitch for us. Yeah, every every game I watch, I I, I tend to look to him, and um, and he he always gets us going. And I think he did. We had a lovely move down the right hand side. Ben White sent down the sides, and he he runs down, chops it back onto his left foot, and then curls the iron robin shot that we all expecting to go in. It misses, and we're all thinking, "What's what's mm. wrong with him? <laughs> 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 what's up with your son?" <laughs> you know what I mean, that's got to go in. It's nil nil at the time, listener. <laughs> I was a bit nervous, <laughs> and um, and and he always does that first thing that gets us going. And um, obviously, he was the he was the he got the Jesus got the penalty and he was able to put the ball away. Of course, all the commentary around it is, do you remember West Ham last year? And obviously the Euros in the back of his mind. I'll tell you what, he just scored a crucial penalty. He also won three away at Brighton. But let's bring him back mentally to the dark days of Euro to, <laughs> Euros and West Ham, because that's going to help. You know what I mean? So, um, and so he managed to smile those questions off and, um, and go from there. But, me and Paul were discussing the wide players uh, last night on News Reaction, and um, and Paul quite cleverly gave <laughs> gave Martinelli a stock falling in your absence, Elliot, and uh, he did that. <laughs> but what w- he wouldn't was, happen on my watch, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Paul was just he was running wild. <laughs> he said, "Right," and um, but really, it was it was to engender a discussion, really, around the dynamic around the wide men, and and I think it's a really worthwhile discussion. I think. My conclusion was we have four wide men now that we are using and we're using our resources. You know what I'm like, Mike, to be consistent. I love to see resources used properly. And with the health of Martinelli and Saka, they seem to be sharing the right. And with the health of Jesus, and not Trossard, but Jesus, more so Jesus, although he's getting fitter, they seem to be sharing the left. And as I'm sitting here today, I'm thinking, well, it's not too bad, is it? It doesn't look too bad. And, um, but I'm someone who's not obsessed by first 11s. And uh, Paul admitted that he was. And Elliot, I know you are, right? So, um, mm-hmm. so, yeah, I quite like this. And given we're playing every three days and the wide positions are very, 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 very intensive, you know, on, on sprints, on recoveries, on going, we expect them to have the sprints to go forward. I like seeing this use of resources because I think we get the power and speed and sharpness and brain for longer rather than seeing players flogged. But that's my view. You know, um, I don't think it's the only view. <laughs> I just want to wonder what you guys think. Yeah, well, first of all, let me read you a quote Mikel had on Gabriel Jesus' involvement. I was really happy, especially on the side. The way they attacked, which was the opportunities were there for him to score in certain moments. He had two big chances as well that he could have converted. 
<laughs> there's a news flash. <laughs> uh, but his contribution, the last thing he does for the first goal, just winning the penalty tells you that. So we're getting him back. I think he can have a huge impact for us. And I just, I see a player in Gabriel Jesus that is going to be important for us down the stretch, but is going to have to be important in whatever position is needed in the given moment or the given game. Today it was to to debut, uh, to, to debut, to come in for um, Martinelli with Saka's, Injury situation, I cannot imagine he plays every game. And I think if Jesus is in a good moment and in good form and the, the manager's trusting him, I do think we will see him start from the right for Saka at times and, and through the middle at times for Kai with maybe Kai dropping back to eight or dropping to the bench to get a little rest in this run. And so having him in good form is great. Whether he has to start every game is another story. Let's not forget a Leo Trossard who scored a lovely chipped goal to make this three, by the way, runs away, but positions himself well in front of the defender so we can't the defender can't get through him. And then kind of like fakes the shot and chips it. It's beautiful. I, I think in Trossard, Jesus, Saka, Martinelli, and Kai, we have enough to manage this run. And it's really special to have a group where you trust all of those players. Maybe not totally equally, but at a level where if any of them start or any of them have to come in in a critical moment, you feel good about it. So, Paul, I I am prepared to come to Clive's side grudgingly that maybe with the front three, it is not a case of thinking in terms of starters. It is thinking in, in terms of a group. And we are very fortunate to have a group of five, Kai, Jesus, Trossard, Saka, and Martinelli, that are trusted and have the quality, all of them, to play any of the games we have remaining. Yeah. Well, I think that's... <laughs> he says and, not agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> weak and cowardly, Elliot. I thought we had an understanding <laughs> that you could read too much into a starting 11, and I'm not shifting from that position. No, I think this is much bigger than that. I think the manager has tipped his hand here, and he's made a decision, and he, like... Martinelli is not fully fit. He's not match fit. He had a big choice for this game. He could get Gabriel Jesus fully bedded into playing with Havertz as striker, or he could get Martinelli ready to play against Bayern. And I think from your earlier comments, you think Martinelli's starting against Bayern. He's not. It's Gabriel Jesus. And he decided to get one more game with, with Gabriel Jesus working with Havertz so that that kind of flow, that understanding. So, it, like, I guess we already realized Havertz was the man at center forward, and Mikel's comments here are so strong that it doesn't sound like if you're listening to that as Gabriel Jesus, you're like, oh, fuck, I'm not playing for a while. Except Gabriel Jesus is now your left wing for a little while. Now, it won't be forever. So, in that sense, I agree with Clive. Horses for courses, don't get... But I would get too hung up on the first 11 right now. We're playing Bayern in a couple of days, and the manager had a choice, and Gabriel Martinelli hasn't started for a while and isn't ready to start against Bayern. And I, what's it all about? I think we saw some craft in this game. We, we saw the aggressive way that Gabriel Jesus covers back, maybe even more so, then Gabriel Martin, uh, Martinelli's no slouch on that. So I don't think that's exactly what it's all about. I think uh, Arteta said, this is the run-in. It's all about players who've been there, experience. He's got Havertz, who's won a Champions League final. He's got uh, Odegaard, captain of Norway, Norway, and tremendous experience under his belt with Arsenal. And who, who else would you play there anyway? He's got... Uh, Rice, who's won a, a a European Cup last year, and who else would you play anyway? He's got Jorginho, who, like, party didn't get 20 minutes in this game. I, I wonder who's starting against Bayern. I mean, who else is ready? And I think he's decided in the run-in, ex experience is king, and you're going to see Gabriel Jesus for a few critical games here. He he's He's tipped his hand. That's what's happening. And... He's leaning into Gabriel Jesus for a little while here. In in the medium long term, I fully agree with you guys. But that well, that well, starting was a was the Bayern starting eleven. It wasn't a ooh, let's rest Martinelli who hasn't played for fucking forever as a starter. We'll see. I mean, I, I, well, let me ask you something about that, Clive. You always talk about the game for your life. Who's starting the game for your life? Mm. I want to ask you a slightly different question, which is: Do you get the sense that? 
there is even a, a quote unquote first 11. I mean, we know Sack is in it, but beyond that, do, do you believe that in terms of the attacking areas, Mikel's going to just continue to rot- rotate through these players for their balance of the season um, without there being an established hierarchy? So I, I'm, I'm generally not sure, but what I am sure about is since w- us good people on this podcast have been podcasting, we have never been in the Champions League quarterfinal. We've never had this schedule ahead of us. And so everything I'm seeing now looks really interesting, and I, I'm, I'm quite enjoying it. We've never been at this phase of the season where we've had five substitutes at this level of competition. But, you know, so I'm, my mind is completely open. And, I, and I'm not sure I want to close it. I think Paul's point around experience is a really valid one. And I was thinking about that on my walk this morning. When it push comes to the shove, that's one of the most experienced teams we can put on the pitch. And you just put it on there. You know, and they and they did really well. So that's a good angle to have a look at it. There's also the angle around making sure we're fresh when it really, really matters. And in that sort of five guys that you named earlier, I, uh, Elliot, I wanted to add Eddie to that group, who's come on for the last couple of games for Kai as centre forward. So, are we seeing true? Oh, I've done it again. Are we seeing? Um... <laughs> <laughs> I got to stop talking to my watch. Are we seeing? Um... Are we seeing a, a full a full group, and we're and we're going to use that group accordingly? And yeah, it, that's what it looks like in the last two or three games. And I think he's I think he's really good. You know. In the Man City game, Jesus who's played left in Man City game, we all sort of wondered. We, we knew about the health of other players. We thought, okay, we sort of sort of talked it off, right? But actually, in that game, he did the Saka stuff. He was the one getting the chances. He was the one doing the first thing that made us think we might score. He missed a few of them, but he was the one that's getting them. You know, and I thought, and this game again, he got the early movement. He got the penalty and another shot at the edge of the area. I'm thinking... Why would I not want that bloke on the pitch at some point? I bet if I, I want to have a chat with Scott later and just sort of say to him, how many chances he had in the last two games that he's played? Mm. And what's he done? He's, I, I, bet the, I bet the number will be quite high. I don't think to myself, well, forget what I used to think before. We're getting output from this guy. His kind of covering running angles were brilliant. There was one, I think Paul touched on it. There was one in the first half when we got spun in centre midfield. James Lewis appeared off the sideline like a, like he, just, he just hunted them down. You know, I just you you, you watch the team when they run back. Now they run back and inward towards zone fourteen, and it all collapse in the central area, knowing that you go there, you stop them. They got to go back out, and then we can get reorganised. Trossard did it, so this is a this is something that we're doing. This was planned. It's happening a lot recently. So our recovery line running is really, really good, and really, really tenacious and intense. And Jesus does that. They're all doing it, and so for me. I, I'm enjoying it, mate. I'm enjoying what I'm seeing. I'm enjoying the the differences. I'm enjoying the fact that people are being challenged for their spots. I think it's very important that we don't have that mentality of first eleven because it will it will happen. It will just appear. It'll appear by form, delivery, health, what you actually do. It will just appear. It becomes so obvious. We'll all be able to pick it at this moment in time. The schedule says, let's just manage these people properly. And a lesson from last year, right, when we ran out of legs, let's make sure we don't do that again. Yeah, and it, it's very easy to say, all right, yeah, but you just got to pick the absolute best 11 for, for Bayern on Tuesday, and you do, but then you got to think, well, but then it's Aston Villa on Sunday, and then, okay, but then it's Bayern again on Wednesday, and that's how it's going to be to the, to the end of the season. And so I, I think having a cadence of players that you can rotate is going to help. Look, there's some you can't. Saliba and Gabriel, I think he's – going to try to start him every single game the rest of the season i really do probably ben white as well probably declan rice as well um huge huge benefit to have gotten rice out for the luton game but i mean gabriel and saliba are just gonna have to keep doing their thing and there's gonna be a few players like that but up front he has options um and it's interesting right because we all wanted a, a another wide forward in the summer and we all really thought we should get a striker in january and here we are in a very crowded hectic run in scoring goals for fun best goal difference in the league most goals scored in the league and like we have five good forward players that we really trust maybe six and that's that's a, a brilliant place for us to be so i i don't think we need to overthink who starts too much, even though that's traditionally my role anyway. Um, but it will be very interesting to see who he picks the next few games. Quick point on the Villa game, by the way. Douglas Louise is absolutely ducking us. I don't know if you guys saw this, but he picked up a yellow card 90 plus 8 
in their uh, draw against Brentford. And very Unai Emery of him to rotate all his players for the City game and then drop points at home to Brentford. But that means Luis will not face us um, this coming weekend uh, at the Emirates. So that is a nice little boost for that game, I should mention. Okay, it's way too late in the pod to get to it, but we are here now. I'll start with you, Clive. I'll stay with you for a second. The Kai Havertz thing is so interesting. And I think Mikel gave a little something away in his answer to the questions post-match that I want to read to you because I think Mikel's vision was for Kai to be eight, to play the eight. I think that was really his vision. But Kai has excelled as a striker for us, and so that's where he's playing. And I think the manager is even sort of grudgingly accepting that that's what he's got to do because he was asked if Kai Havertz has found his best position. And this is an interesting answer, okay? A lot of the time, players decide where they have to play, and we can have certain ideas, but then you see certain relationships and some things flow. And when it flows, you have to let it go. And I think Kai at the moment is flowing, and he's feeling really comfortable there. The rest of the team is comfortable with him there, and things happen naturally. Clive, I mean, I think that's as much as Mikel is going to give away, that maybe this wasn't the plan, but this is what's working. And I think it takes a lot of credit. A lot of credit goes to Mikel, too, because for a manager that sometimes is accused of being you know, too dogmatic or too robotic where things leveled at him, he's seen a player that's thriving in a position, and he's going with it, and it's working. So kudos to Kai for making the position his. Kudos to the manager for letting him take it. What are your thoughts on Kai's evolution into that position and how he played against Brighton? Yeah, so I, I haven't played. He was brilliant against Brighton, so that's <laughs> just absolutely brilliant. He's been brilliant for quite a while. Um, but my, my view on it is I don't think he ever committed to him being just an eight. Mm. I think he said he was versatile. First game he played for us, it was at the Community Shield, and he played nine. And so, and Elliot, you know my views. Remember, we were so, I was so excited after that game because I, I saw something that I hadn't seen from an Arsenal team against City for forever, it feels like. So, um, so, yeah, I, I think if I look at the way Arsenal play, they have a bottom of the box, they have a top of the box. He was always going to be a top of the box player. Right? So, left top of the box. Obviously, with Jesus there, the first sort of iteration we saw was Jesus dropping in and Kai running in behind him. Why? Because on direct play, we can get to him quickly. We all liked it. Luton away, a great example of them two working together. We saw Martin Elliott on the outside. We thought, oh, there you go. There's the plan. That looks nice. But, the, but things change. People get injuries, people come out, different balances. I always thought he was a nine, sorry, a eight, nine. That's what I thought the plan was, if you ask me honestly. And he seems to be now a nine, eight, in that order. And that's, that's fine by me because that style of forward I love. The way we, we're starting to play a little bit is almost like double false nines or double, four, double tens. He can do that very, very well. He gets back in very, very well. Him and Odegaard, they have a relationship that's just forming. And, and when, they, when we go 4 4 2 block, they go in, they lead the press. They're both very aggressive and quick across the ground and very intelligent. So there's synergy there straight away. When we are, when we're penned back in, we have, they go one plus one, we split them. Odegaard comes to receive on the floor. Kai goes long to receive in the air. Very smart use again of the two player skill sets. Kai's main weakness was maybe ball progression on the floor, but now his his link up play is really really good. So his progressive pass numbers may not look so good, but his link up is stunning, right? So, so when he receives it, he can just he can pin people back so easily. I thought he had some free kicks given against him, which were not free kicks. Just a referee not understanding the contest and the bout that was ongoing in the, in the fight. He didn't get it. Kai was mugging them. He was mugging them off big time. He was knocking them early, sneaking around the side, ref- and people holding their faces. I mean, it's embarrassing. He had them. He had them in every single facet of the game, on the ground, down the sides, receiving to feet, in the air. He was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And and so I I love this development. I've always wanted a, a tall forward. That's just, but I didn't expect this guy to be it. If I'm honest with you, but I'm, and lots of people are saying he's more of a nine than an eight. I think you can do both. I'm not going to close off on, on either. But if we buy a centre forward in the summer, for example, and this was what, remember we did the director of football thing we did? I, I, I mm-hmm. saw, see maybe a more development forward. But if, I, I, I sort of stand by that. I sort of stand by that development forward or around 40 million as a centre forward option. 
that gives us a lot of what Kai has in size and physicality and running power. But a day when he needs to sit and then maybe spend our money on a on a a true centre mid, you know, an eight six, you know, that can maybe give some other people who are getting old some rest time. So yeah, I like it, mate. I don't know how you guys feel, but I like this evolution of the player and it doesn't bother me that it may not have been the primary plan. When you have versatile players, you can change plan and it's and, you, and, that's, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, I, I think in his goal, you saw a real striker behavior. He makes two runs, right? One for the defender and one for himself. He kind of cuts inside the defender, faints to that way. Then he cuts back outside of that defender to the near post to beat him to score the goal. He obviously shows his in-game intelligence with the way he sets Trossard away for the third goal. Just a, a, a brilliant, thoughtful moment. Um, he's now up to eight goals and four assists in the league, 12 total Goal involvements, um, a really nice return, and I think we could see that grow quite a bit before the end of the season. I should mention, as I'm sure people know by now, I got tricked by an interviewer question um, after the last game uh, in the press conference following the Luton game. Mikel was asked, you know, what do you think about him being on nine yellows and walking a tightrope? He obviously was not on nine yellows. He was on eight. He now cannot be banned for yellow accumulation before game week 32, so he's clear of that risk. Um, let me read what Mikel said on Havertz being a different player in person since the start of the season. He said, yeah, obviously he is in a different moment. He's got some fantastic players around him. We have tried to create the right environment for him, which I think is very important to any player. We've given him confidence. I think hopefully we've given the love that he needs. And after he has the appreciation from the rest of the players and the staff and now our supporters for sure. And Paul, you know, I think back to earlier in the season when he scored that important goal and Mikel kind of carried him, dragged him to the fans to go get his love and appreciation that when he was given the penalty, right, when he was hadn't scored yet and he was able to open his account for Arsenal with the penalty and some of the things we did to get him comfortable, and now it's paying dividends. And maybe just a little bit of a reminder that in, a, in an era of football where every player is judged completely by their last performance, that we do have to just find ways to be patient, even though patience is hard to come by. He's he's been brilliant. I'm curious your your thoughts on his performance against Brighton specifically, obviously, but also just the the evolution into this role and maybe how it changes us as a team as well. Yeah, look, in keeping with my usual policy of reading too much into everything, um, I I thought about Arteta's comments on Havertz first, looking at him individually, and like I thought he was coming in as primarily a left eight, and so. To me, he's obviously saying, look, Havertz has maybe not reinvented himself, but reinvented himself for the second time as a uh, false nine. I love what he's doing. I love his movement. I love the running. Uh, absolutely in love with this guy and how he plays and how he it, – It's in some ways, it's Havertz. It's also the Havertz thing, just – the knock-on impacts to how we play our movement. He's a nightmare for defenders. Um, he drops in, then he spins, then he runs in behind. Those runs in behind are just, he's killing them. He's going left, he's going right, he's going over to the right wing. Um, he always makes that run. And him and Jorginho look for each other all the time. I mean, the cutback for his goal is Jorginho going to the byline. They just have an understanding that Jorginho goes to the byline. Havertz has to beat the centre back to get to the six yard box first because he knows it's coming. And they look for each other before the before Havertz makes the run, before Jorginho makes the pass. They're looking for each other and they love playing together. And it's kind of a beautiful thing. And whoever thought that we'd be saying we're we love having these two Chelsea players, let alone one. But in Mikel's comments, I think there's something else, which is part of the reason he never thought he was going to be playing Havertz up top all the time is because now he has to play Rice as left eight. Not a problem, as it turns out, but I don't think that was the original plan that he was going to play all his games at left eight. It also means that he needs Georgie. He wasn't planning to play Jorginho at DM game in, game out. And like we talk about him being a kind of not every three games. Well, guess what? I think he's playing against Bayern. He wasn't planning to play Gabriel Jesus, and if my hunch is right, uh, he will be playing Gabriel Jesus 
who he sees as a starter, so he means he has to play him off the left wing with Havertz at centre forward. This was out, like when he says this, kind of hints this wasn't really his his plan that Havertz would be centre forward. It's having multiple knock on effects to what three other players. It's four players where he's had to kind of tear up the plan and do something different. Yeah. Yeah, well said. And and dear listener, I have to tell you at this point, if you're even hearing a podcast at all, kudos to you because the audio problems we are having are so substantial. But I don't know what I expected from the uh, Wi-Fi in this particular uh, hotel and in this particular region. So we're doing the best we can. Having said that, to demonstrate my professionalism and commitment to uh, to this this uh, recording that we are doing, I am still going to tell you to shave your privates. I'm not going to leave that un- unsaid. So it is a reminder that you need to visit Manscaped. You need to buy all their products and then shave all your all your privates. All your privates? How many privates do you have? You know what? That's none of my business. However many you have, shave them all. Uh, that's right. I am in the land of, of sun, and that means bathing suits, and that means I've got my collection of Speedos out. I wouldn't feel comfortable wearing them if it wasn't for the lawnmower uh, and the and the the – um, tonics and lotions that they have down there. So why the lawnmower? Long battery life. You can use it in the shower. It has skin safe technology. They've now added a foil blade so you can go completely smooth um, as opposed to just trimming and getting pretty smooth. So the foil blade is great. There's a light so you can see what you're doing. There's the beard hedger. Um, so if you do want to clean up your beard, they have tools for that as well. They have a face shaver. I, I brought the little travel face shaver that they have, which I love because I could charge it before I left. I won't need to charge it on this whole trip. So I can use that to shave my face, use a lawnmower to shave my privates, all while I'm here without having to worry about charging it instead of just some old razor that you use to do the job. Look, it's this simple. It's something that we all do, and you just should have the right products to do it. Um, plus, you get a shed travel bag, the boxers, all that. So go ahead and get the, the lawnmower's products. You're going to love them. Go to lawnmower, not lawnmower, uh, manscaped.com. Uh, use promo code Arsenal Vision. Get 20% off from free shipping. That's 20% off from free shipping. Manscaped.com. Do it now. And this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp isn't online therapy. It's just therapy. It's just therapy. And therapy is just one of the more important things you can do for yourself. Um, I think I mentioned this on a previous podcast, but like my my mother moved to Minnesota to be closer to us, my mom and dad. Um, they're in their 80s. They wanted to be closer to my wife and I and our kids so they could see their grandkids more. But as a result of moving, like my mom doesn't have her therapist now and she's not driving anymore. So that makes it hard. So something that she's done her whole life that was really helpful for her and and that really, I think, helped her process things she deals with, she couldn't do it. Well, I said to her the other day, why don't you use better help? And she's like, oh, that's that online thing. I said, it's not that online thing. It's just therapy. And so she's like, all right, you know, that's actually a really good point because I can do something I've always liked. I can find someone I connect with. I can re-engage in this thing that I, I lost because I can't drive anymore. So it just shows you, you know, this is something that we we should do and BetterHelp makes it easy and accessible and affordable to do it um, on your terms, camera on, camera off, you name it. So learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash vision today to get 10% off your first month. It's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash vision. And last but certainly not least is Unified. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, which is, of course, also a world-class athlete, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance, okay? The Unified, and that's U-N-I-F-Y-D, Healing, is new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by the Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, you want to listen up. The technology promotes wellness, relaxation, purification, rejuvenation, whether you're here uh, in the U.S., I'm actually not in the U.S. right now, so here in this uh, tropical location, or hundreds of other locations around the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D, unifiedhealing.com slash Arsenal Vision to learn more and find a center near you. That's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash Arsenal Vision Club. Is that enough of that? Indeed. Got it. Okay. Clive, um, let's wrap up on the Brighton game so we have time to talk about Bayern before the internet explodes again. We're now on recording number four, uh, which is a higher number (laughs) than you want um, at this stage of a podcast. Um, But it's fun. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Who doesn't love a puzzle? Um, So, Clive, a few bits and bobs and pieces to uh, pick out of this. First of all, can we just go big picture again for a minute? Um, This team is just absolutely humming along. And to go to the Amex and win 3-0 at a place that nobody had won since August, and to do it not just where we won, but th- more than 3xG scored, less than half an expected goal allowed. Let me let me give you a stat here real quick that's pretty incredible. 
If you look at the expected goals allowed since the calendar ticked over to 2024, the average in the league is around 18 or 20 or 19. The second best team, Manchester City, 12.28. That's really good. Arsenal's expected goals allowed in 2024, 4.98. Four goals allowed this year, this calendar year. It is really stunning. And you see the players just feeling and understanding. I love Jorginho being the one to overlap and cut the ball back for Kai for his goal. They just understand where to be. They're so intelligent. Sack is down. That space is available. The Brighton line is broken. I'm going to go make that run. Just from a big picture standpoint, are you able to zoom out and appreciate how special this performance was and, and how dominant we are as a football inside right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, intelligence is a bedrock of of this group. Um, you know, football IQ, whatever you want to call it, they're very intelligent players, and and their recognition of what to do to cover each other is really really good. The collective tenacity to get to the ball. If someone misses the ball or misses their detail, no one just stands there with their arms in the air. They basically say, "Well, I'll do that job." I mean, I think Ben White got caught high in one game, one part of the game. Um, no, I think Kai Havertz played a bit of a clippy, uh, vertical, horizontal pass. It got cut out, so Kai didn't make sure he does his work to get back in to make sure they can't get towards our goal. There's just no egos there, and, and, and I love it. I do think, you know, I'm learning about football through this team, and I'm learning not to have a narrow view and to have, not to try to put a plan in my head and say, that's the plan, and when I see something different, that. That isn't the plan. I think Paul spoke really well on that just now. And I could, you know, from the first start of the season, from the first game we when we signed Timber and we thought, oh, we've, we're not sure if we're buying a right centre-back or a right-back. And let's be honest, he's probably best role for this group right now is as a left-back. Was that the plan? Don't know, right? Don't know, but it looked pretty good, didn't it? You know, and he's just having the right sort of players and talent identification, I think, was really, really key. You know, who'd have thought that Keevil would have played eight, eight or nine games as a left back and we would score a million goals and concede one or two? Uh, was that the plan? Don't know. We brought him to the left centre back, you know, and uh, basically he's just having good, talented people. And when you have that, and you have that sort of collective. <clears throat> Elliot, me, me and Paul spoke last night. It sort of, as I was talking to him, I thought, bloody hell, mate, we're really good. I don't want to utter those words, those words that make us sound overconfident. But yes, we haven't got the recent history of managing these total run-ins. We haven't been to Champions League finals. We, we haven't got league winners' medals in recent years. It's been 20 years. But if you are being honest, your eyes, look at the three teams involved, your eyes are telling you, I, I hesitate to use these words. Your eyes are telling you that we might actually be the best team. And that's I, what it looks like to me. Clive, I, don't, I mean, you know, this is where football supporters get so precious about shit. Like, if a Liverpool fan hears that and they go on to win, they're like, oh, are you sure you're the best team? Like, it because it's not one based on head to head. You know, if you look at American sport, right? I'm not saying I prefer this, but there's playoffs, right? There's a Super Bowl or there's a World Series or whatever it is, and two teams play each other. It's cup, it's a cup final at the end of the season. Whereas in the league, it's who's on top of the table at the end. And if you're on top of the table, you get to win the trophy. But I don't think there's any question at least in this calendar year, Arsenal are the best team. We are a dominant team, we play dominant football, we give up nothing, and we create a ton. And like yeah, if, if you go 10 wins, no losses, one draw, and if we can keep that run going and score 30 and concede four, if you don't win the title at the end of it, I mean, it's going to be painful, but I don't think you can have any question about who finished the season as as the best team, and right now that's us. Paul, one of the reasons we are, though, again, is because of, of how much we restrict as well. And I just want to read a quote. On the team celebrating Gabriel's block at the end, Gabriel blocked that shot at the very end. I think it was like 90 plus four, 90 plus five. Mikel said, that's really pleasing for all the coaches to see that reaction from the team at 3-0. It's great because that tells you how much they want it, the importance and the focus they put in every single ball. That was an extra bonus today. Guys, I don't know if you saw it, and I don't want to be accused of being too online, but I think you can read something into what players post on social media. Remember, these are young guys, and social media is part of their language. It's part of how they communicate. 
Did you notice that a number of the players had posts on social media that said, are you not entertained? I think Mikel has drilled into them, or maybe they've just picked up this idea that they're not fun, they're not entertaining, they don't play exciting football, and they've internalized it and made it a rallying cry. And I think in that, are you not entertained? It's like, hey, you know, we don't have to be entertainers. We're here to win things. Um, and, and there's, I think every good manager finds a way to create an us against them siege mentality. Maybe that's a little part of it that Mikel is trying to build in. But a big identity of this team is white Gabriel Saliba and bolting the back door. And I think the way they celebrated blocking that shot late shows you that. So how, how special is that trio in particular, Paul, but also the, the identity of this team for as dynamic as we are being about that bolted back door that you just cannot create anything against us and you cannot score against us. Whoever would have thunk that this Arsenal, that Arteta would take this Arsenal and turn it into the most machine-like, absolute, abandon all hope defense for... uh, Like, this is five away games in a row where we've blanked the opposition. It's absolutely astounding. Absolutely astounding. Um, And like the level of trust that it engenders in the fans. Um, I do think we, we, we lived with the fact that Brighton are going to play out a bit and we planned for it. And we knew we had that defense. And with Gabriel Jesus and Havertz and others cutting in, we're like, we'll handle it. Um, they're a phenomenal bunch. I think what I was most struck about in the celebrations for uh, the block by Gabrielle is you often see the two centre backs celebrating, or the centre back and the the full back, and like this, I had there were midfielders jumping in there and celebrating, like they all get it how important it is to to our defensive unit and how important it is to the identity of the team that you shall not pass past this point. Um, it's a phenomenal group. There's just a different feel about that defense. And I, look, we've got to give some props to the pundits, right? It's only taken them till the 31st game of the season to realize Arsenal are absolutely effing outstanding. And it only <laughs> taken all the results of 2024, all of the stats, real and expected for them to finally realize, holy shit, these are guys are actually good. We have been the invisible team, and we're in this very interesting position where, yeah, we're the best team in the league. Um, it feels like each team's going to keep winning the games, but somebody's going to slip up at some point, and we're still not feeling any pressure. Like, we're feeling the pressure to chase, but we're not feeling the pressure of contenders. And I think emotionally, we're pretty fresh going into the Champions League, going uh, this this two-header, going into the run-in for the rest of the league. It's going to be challenging managing all those games. But emotionally, it's been relatively as, fu- as much... It's been fun, and the competition for players to get on the pitch, Martinelli versus Jesus, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is going to keep these guys humming where they're not all worried about the run-in and the pressure. They got enough on their hands just getting in the team without sweating the big picture. So I think emotionally we're in a really, really good spot. Lots of players coming back, players off the bench, the strength of that bench yesterday. Dunno. I feel pretty good about this group. And it's built on the bedrock of that defense because we don't have those games where you feel you're hanging on for dear life. In fact, we can sit in and manage it and let them bounce off the outside of us. Yeah. I mean, you look at Liverpool needing to win the game at home against Sheffield United with 15 minutes to play, and you look at us going to the Amex and just swatting Brighton aside, maybe this fixture focus, this focus on who has the hardest fixtures is the wrong focus. Maybe the focus should be who's the team playing the best football because the team playing the best football is the team that's probably going to accrue the most points. And at the moment, I think you'd have to say that's us, but we don't know where it's going to go. I hope we can just enjoy it. Clive, let's just get a final word on this game so we can shift gears to to Byron for a minute and get out of here um, before uh, the jigsaw pieces of this recording get any smaller. Um, I just, I, I just wanted to see if you had, any little bits and pieces you want to pick out from that in terms of our defensive record, that group at the back, and and you can include Ryan that, by the way, if you want. I thought he made 
you know, we didn't have much to do in this game, but made the important saves when they came. And that that's the personality of this team. Um, and I'll admit, a couple of years ago, when we were defensively solid but boring and couldn't attack, I um, and we weren't even that defensively solid, let's be honest. But like, I I don't know that I understood it. But now I see a team that's built on the bedrock of not giving things away, and how that gives us a platform to go and, and accrue points at this kind of rate. And it's it's absolute evil genius for Mikel Arteta. Uh, you know, have to have to tip your hat to him, of course. What do you think about that? The the defensive record in that that group at the back. Yeah, we, you know, I've always been a pragmatist, uh, Elliot. Yeah, and me too. Defense, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, we, we see different sides of the ball, but by the way, that's absolutely okay. fine, by the way. Yeah, it's brilliant, and I, I, I love... Yeah. People see the attack first, and, and I've always seen the defence first, and I tend to worry about that side of things. We, we had a brief discussion about Zinchenko yesterday, and I said to Paul, I'm not sure he did anything that wrong. But I just worried about it. Do you know what I mean? And um, and then you have we have a discussion this morning online about the trade off between Zinchenko's ability on ball versus defense's ability. Mate, these are first world problems. We conceded zero goals. It feels like for ages, and we're just discussing the team, but and discussing its development opportunities. But yeah, that's the way I see football. I think once you have that defensive platform, everything feels less pressured. Your forwards don't feel as pressured to score. I think that's really important. So, so yeah, I think this is a really key part of a makeup of a football team, and you go where you there, you where you want to go. And so, f- f- defense ability, security, you can do things with that, and you can travel places with that. And it's particularly important that we've got some big away games upcoming, and you have to have that. You have to. So yeah, defense first for me, mate. Defense first, attack second. I just expect the attack to work. All those fancy Dan number 10s, you know I don't like them, right? I, I expect, <laughs> I, 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 I sort of suffer them, but I don't really like them. You give me a Kai Havertz any day, you know, you know, you give me those type of players, you give me a Rice, you give me those, you give me Ben White. I like the, I like the fighters. I like them guys. No, I'm going to stop no, you there, Clive, and just point out that you are definitely not getting the interview after Odegaard signs his next contract. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but to be fair, mate, isn't he a big fighter? Isn't yeah, he a big yeah. fighter? And yeah. why do you know there are days when he's on the ball, play goes, but he's off the ball, play is absolutely on it, and he leads by example. And, and that's the way I, I look at football. The contest is all important to me, and um, and this team seems to grasp that, and all of them have. I mean, could you? I, I keep going. I won't keep going back to it. But Trossard's not a great defender, but he really tried in this game. Did we, did we all see what Smith Rowe did in the week? This is not normal, you know. This is that means it's a, there's a collective buy-in that people are doing things which are not their strengths, and they're committing to it, and it's benefiting the wider group, right? So, um, Elliot. <laughs> Just got to shut up, right? Because I don't want it to be sound be called an arrogant Arsenal fan that has got no humility. Um, but I'm excited. It's your fault, by the way. It's you, Matt, and Scott's mm. fault. Because mm. I'm going to call, call you out now. Because before I used to just watch the games, <laughs> I used to watch the games and I wasn't bothered. I watch him and go with my heart and emotion. But now you've got me looking at data and information. And now I, even when we were good, the data was not on our side. And now the data's on our side. I'm thinking, all right, lads, we better win because I'll be coming for all of you. <laughs> I'll be coming for all of you if we don't win because yeah. now my emotions and the and the data are telling me where we are and, and they're aligning. So I'm just hoping we get the end result. Yeah, well, just remember, the data is there until it isn't. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the beautiful thing about it. It, it shifts like sands to the hourglass. Um, yeah, it, it, it is... Uh, it is a it is a wonderful group. It is an easy group to love. You mentioned Troussard. Um, I, I love that he sort of celebrated his goal, that he patted the badge. None of this, um, you know, respecting the club he used to play for stuff. These players are hungry. Um, and, and he was happy with his goal and, and good for him. Uh, it was brilliant. I think we left some goals out there, honestly. I think there were a couple more goals out there, but that's okay. Um, okay, let, let's do this. Let's shift gears to Bayern quickly. There is that fun um that fun moment where you are talking into a microphone and don't even know if you're recording but <laughs> we'll see what happens um clive stay with you for a moment you're going to be at this game it it feels like a massive game and it's a really weird one because i do think that you could almost as strange as it sounds 
wind up overlooking Bayern Munich. And the reason I say that is, I mean, they just lost to Heidenheim, I want to say, as the team. They, they have given away the, the title um, to Bayer Leverkusen. They have not been good in the league. Bayern Munich's director of sport, Max Erbel, was asked on what gives him hope for the Arsenal clash. This is a real quote. He said, quote, at the moment, I can't think of much. I think, you know, you underestimate Bayern at your peril. If you do care about data, their underlying metrics are still some of the best in all of Europe, um, maybe even the best. They're, they're right there anyway. They still do have Harry Kane, who will certainly know how to be effective against Arsenal at the Emirates. Um, and by be effective, I mean dive and win a penalty. But it, it's, it's interesting because I think in the last few weeks with the way we're playing and with the way they're playing, we probably now go into this with people starting to feel we should win it. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are as you head into this, your confidence level and looking at a Bayern that seems like they're, they're vulnerable but still carries a big threat. Yeah, they do. The badges are still the same, right? They're still Bayern Munich, and um, they've got a few trophies in their <clears throat> in their trophy cabinet that we haven't even sniffed, right? So we have to respect them. But you know, as you we were talking pre pod, you said we we're going to talk about Bayern, so I thought I'd watch a few highlights <laughs> and um, of the of the latest game when they lost three two, and the Dortmund game. Mate, they're conceding all types of chances mm. through the middle, back post, crosses. Set anything you like, anything you can think of, they're conceding them. And it just tells me that there's not a collective spirit there, particularly off the ball. And there's no confidence in their defensive stability. And without that, I don't care how many goals you're scoring, you're not going to win anything. Um, it's 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 really interesting watching that team crumble. And I heard something on TV this morning, so I'm going to repeat it. It wasn't mine, but you see Klopp has announced his you know, going to be going at the end of the season, and so and Tuchel's going into the season. Look at the reaction of both of those teams, Liverpool and Bayern Munich. Liverpool decided we're going to send off our manager in the right possible way, uh, giving it everything to do so, exceeding the expectations when it comes to players who are injured coming to that group and getting results. And Bayern Munich have chucked it in. They've chucked it in. They've just stopped winning. They've stopped playing. But by Leverkusen, I mean, it's incredible. They have not lost any competitive game this season. I mean, that is just incredible. And Bayern Munich have creaked under the pressure. But that pressure has been has been there for a few years. You know, they have not... Their points total from winning the league has been falling. The competition hasn't been strong. So they're still winning. This year, Leverkusen said, nah, we're going we're gonna to put you under real pressure. And Bayern Munich have crumbled. And it's going to be so interesting to see... If they go back to Julian Nagelsmann and, and, and recreate something they had before, what they're going to do in this group, I don't know. Look at their team that played yesterday. They've got Kim Min Jae and Dea Upamecano playing as centre backs with Dilit and Eric Dyer on the bench. I'm not sure if Dilit and Eric Dyer were being rested for the Arsenal game. <laughs> I'm not sure. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> because, they're, because they're a couple of wardrobes that so you have to move them. <laughs> you get re- removal men to move them around the pitch. So that would be interesting. The fullbacks are great names in Kimmich and Alonso Davis, but I'm not sure that Kimmich is a, is a very good player. Let's, let's, let's respect him. Alonso Davis had a tough season this year, so let's see how that goes on that side of the pitch. And he can stand in the wrong places on occasion. So, no Leroy Sane. I'm not sure why Elliot, to be honest. And Serge Gnabry just come back into the group. Mate, great names. Great names. Thomas Muller, Kane. You have to respect them. Musiala, you have to respect them. But if you're not together as a team, you're just a group of individuals that are not connected. And we are that team that's connected at the moment. And we know what it looks like and what it feels like. So long yeah. lives the day when Bayern are disconnected and hopefully have given up the ghost. I think you look at it, though, and you make the point. Sané, Nabry, Kane, Muller, Musiala. We have an excellent defense. But as you know in football it still comes down to winning your duels, right? It still comes down to 1v1s. And like any one of those players can score a goal from nothing, can have a moment of brilliance and have you sitting there going, we had all the ball, we had all the chances, we really dominated. How did we wind up drawing 1-1 or losing 1-0 or losing 2-1? And I, I think the the thing that I really believe about this tie, at least the, the, the Emirates uh, first leg, I think we will outplay them whether or not we come away with the result 
that the footballing dominance deserves is going to come down to the individuals. And you would have to say, at least at this point right now, that in Musiala and Kane and Sané and Nabry and Muller, they have guys that know how to find the back of the net, even with the thinnest of chances. So that that will be the danger. And to your point that you made, I, I think that they are vulnerable defensively. I don't think they're fighting for Tuchel. I don't think Tuchel's system is working for them, obviously. Um, I don't know, you know, does it benefit Harry Kane that he knows Arsenal very well, or does it benefit Arsenal that they know Harry Kane very well and they know what his threat is and, and how to play against him? Um, I guess we will see. I, I'm always going to back Mikel Arteta to have a plan for a player that he knows this well. Um, there will be no Bayern fans at the Emirates. They're banned. Um, so it, it will be 60,000 just Arsenal fans. And I think really if we want to progress – we cannot come out and look as tentative as we did against Porto. I mean, that's really the only worry I have, Paul, because I think if we come out and play our football with our confidence and our determination that we've shown since the new year, we can get a result in this leg. And I think we must get a result in this leg and, and bring something back to Bayern that we can hold on to. So what do you think? I mean, is is your biggest concern just that we see the the arsenal that we saw against Porto, which was one that looked a little cowed by the competition and the, and the big stage. Cause as long as that doesn't happen, I, I feel very confident. Um, no, my big worry is that Europe is different. Uh, it'll be different for us. It'll be different for Bayern. I mean, the bad news, the good news is they've been terrible in the league. The bad news is they have written off the league. This is their cup final. Um, they may not be a very together team. I'm going to assume they're going to be a very together team when they play the Champions League quarterfinals. This is all they got. Um, those are big names. Some of them don't have a lot of seasons left in them. One or two of them have one season in them or two seasons in, in them at, at Bayern. So, like, I, like, it's great that they're not in a good moment. It's great that they're not the Bayern. But we've we've seen Porto recently play far better against us than we they had any right to expect uh, based on their league form, based on their standing. Europe's different. We'll feel a bit different. We'll be nervy. We'll be edgy. This is going to be super close. The good news is we definitely have a good shot. Like, I do think we're we're a mild favorite in this. Apart from all those other factors, we should be a strong favorite, but like Europe is different. Bayern will absolutely talk themselves into the fact that they will psych us out, that the myth of Bayern, that on this one night in this season, they'll pull it together. So I think it's going to be really, really tough. I think we have enough to get over the line. I, I And I'm not afraid of going to their stadium, by the way. Uh, I might be a little nervous of going to their stadium if we had a couple of goals up, strangely, because that that gets into your head then. But if we still need a result when we go into their stadium, uh, I think we can get that too. So um, fascinating, fascinating times. I, I, I think Arteta is loading up for experience. Uh, you know, that's my Gabriel Jesus point. I think he recognizes this game will have a different feel and he wants more players who've been there who've done that Jorginho Gabriel Jesus Havertz yeah it's going to be a special special evening I want to just tell you one thing to put in context how important it is not to underrate this team okay I know they've looked like crap in their domestic league I know they've lost five games in their domestic league I get all that in terms of expected goal difference Clyde Bayern Munich are top across all five big European leagues. Top, plus 48.6. They are nine better than number two, Inter, and 11 better than number three, Arsenal. In terms of expected goals, they are top of all five big leagues. 5.7 better than Liverpool, okay? More than Barca, more than Inter, more than City, Stuttgart, and Arsenal. In terms of expected goals against, a little weaker, they are fifth in expected goals against just four more allowed than us. So at least from an underlying metric standpoint, and I realize some of that is league strength and they've, you know, they've beaten up on some lesser teams in the league, but let's, let's just bear in mind that there is some data that points to them as still being a very, very, very dangerous team. Um, I think the dynamic that is fascinating about this is that they will come to play football. You know, they are not going to just 
sit in two banks of four and try to counter on us. I mean, even if we can push them back into doing that at times, they're going to come to play football. And I think the last team that came to the Emirates and tried to play football was Liverpool. And we, at least on XG, spanked them. I think the game finished, what, 3-1. Um, we've seen in the Champions League group stage that when teams tried to play us, it was a mismatch. So that will be certainly an interesting dynamic. Uh, let's let's talk lineup just a little bit. Paul's already given his opinion on this, so we sort of know where he stands. I do think Martinelli will start. I think that in Champions League, you want that burst of pace to go the other way, especially against a team that will try to come out and play against you. But I'm curious how you think we'll line up. Jor- Jorginho played the full 90. I kind of wonder if that means we are going to do the thing I said from the last pod of just, you know, party starts one game, Jorginho starts the other, or if you think we're just going to lean on him. What what are your um, what are your early thoughts on on how we might line up against them? Um, we could line with exactly the same team. We could make a couple of changes. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not too, I'm not too worried to be honest, Elliot, because I, I trust the group. If I'm honest with you, I, I think um, the Jesus Martin anything is a discussion. But if it flips the other way around for this game and we end with Jesus and start with Martinelli, none of us would cry ourselves to sleep, would we? Really? No. Nope. Uh, and, um, and that's where we are. And so we just need to. That's that's the progression of the group. We've we've got into a place where a couple of solutions look okay. You know, this twenty twenty four started this year really. Trossard and ha- I think we Trossard playing false nine and have us getting around him. That's when we really started to break thing, teams open. Then we developed when that got stopped at Porto. We went we went another direction. You know, it's just that constant evolution. We've got to be open to it because teams are gonna. Soon see what we do, and then, then we got to change again. You know, and I, I keep talking about this, but it's really important. We need to keep evolving. Just keep doing it. Keep showing different faces. The teams can't rumble us. You know, Mikel was talking about what Brighton were doing on their build-up plan and in the interview after the game. He said they did something different in this game. They went, they did it on the other side. I think it was a full-back progression. They flipped it over from one side to the other. But he knew it, and and his Erby knew he'd be analysed, so he changed his exit plans and that's what we've got to do and that is the game how quickly you adapt to the solutions that so the problems in front of you so yeah it's gonna be interesting that paul has managed to sober me up completely by talking about Bayern in that way and he's absolutely right remember porto the game it was a different game really remember the first two minutes of the away game we thought what the hell are we watching here this is a different game I think ball, ball rolling will, under Declan Rice's foot and Saliba <laughs> not completing a pass. I was like, who are these Who are these frauds that have put on these shirts? Who are these guys? <laughs> what, what is this? Is this the same competition? Is this the same? What is this? I mean, it literally was a different game, a different sport. And so Paul's reminded me of that skillfully. And, um, and Bayern Munich are, are a huge team. But what I will say is they're not in the best place and we're at home. And I think it's duty bound on us to impose ourselves on them and make sure that we we take something back to Munich and I, I, I feel as though we can. I feel as though this game will be closer to a, a game that we recognise just to, to the nature of the Bundesliga and and the Premier League. And it's just up to us to remind remind ourselves who we are. And I think, looking at the Opta this morning and we are still third favourite and the reason why we are that people don't quite trust us to go through these big moments and trust us versus these big teams. And we have to build that trust and if we do beat Bayern Munich, we'll have a little bit more trust. And then people say, oh, well, Bayern Munich in a bad moment. They got through that easily. We just have to keep building and building and building until we get the trust from the outside world. But more importantly, I think we people in the outside world are underestimating the internal desire of these players and this group of coaches to write their own story. And their own story is we want to win. We want to be known as winners. We want to be known as people who have medals. We don't want to be a nice club, a nice team, a nice group of people who all love each other. There's a great connection with the fans and the team and everybody. Now, we want to win. We want to win. We want to be defined as having medals. And that, to me, is the biggest change in this group. There's a determination there. If you're looking, you can see it. And um, soon everyone will see it if we keep going the way we're going. Yeah, um, we'll we'll start to wrap here. But Paul, one one thing that I think is clear: White will start, Saliba will start, Gabriel will start, Raya will start, Rice will start, Saka will start, assuming he's fit. 
I think Kai Havertz will certainly start, which position remains to be seen. But, you know, it's a German team coming to the Emirates. You know, he plays for Germany. I think he'll be well up for it. I think he'll start at striker. There's a question about whether it be Jorginho or maybe Party. There's a question. Odegaard will certainly start this question about whether it be Martinelli or Jesus. But the question we haven't really touched on, we haven't really even touched on his performance against Brighton, and that is the left back situation. You know, I think there there is concern about Zinchenko in some sections of the of the support, and I I get it. Some people want the ones that seem a little more secure. Some people want the ones that progress the ball a little more. I don't want to get into the debate. Is he good? Is he not good? Is he shit? He's not. He's obviously a very good player. He plays for a very good Arsenal. He started a game for an Arsenal that won three 0 at the Amex. Great player, but we have another great player in Tomiyasu. We have another great player in Kibior. They're all different styles, and they all bring all bring different things to the game. And given the individual one v one threat that Munich can put on the pitch, as I mentioned before, Bayern have players that can hurt you that will exploit that space if you leave it. So, do you have a thought on how he might go at left back? I mean, Kibior now, he, you know, we went from playing so much to not playing quite as much. Tomiyasu, his fitness just come back. Same was Zinchenko. I think even more than the Jesus Martinelli thing, Paul, and the Jorginho party thing, I think left back is going to be the one that keeps Mikel up at night a bit, although I'm sure he's known who he's going to play for the last six weeks. So what do you think might happen at that position? Um, we saw the starting 11 at Brighton that's going to play against Bayern. I just, you really believe that? I, huh? I don't know how you can see it any other way. Martinelli's played. <laughs> well, well, I mean, there's, no, there's no, lots hang of other ways you can see it. I mean, no, there isn't. The, okay. This is what fascinates me. I'm like, my mouth's open. Martinelli's played 13 minutes and 16 minutes since March. He's not starting. Like, if if uh, he he came on for a few minutes at on the right wing. He's not ready to play against Bayern. That is not the thinking. The understandings aren't there. He's been out of the loop. He's not starting. Uh, Havertz is absolutely playing striker. There's no question on that. Um, you know, Jorginho, um, he looks fit. I don't see any way he's not going to play Jorginho. And the options at left back are, to- like, does anybody think Tommy Yasu's like when you look at these decisions together, you realize he wasn't looking to rest anybody to keep. The, Martinelli doesn't need to be kept fresh. He needs to play so that he's ready. He doesn't need to be kept fresh to play. Um, so what did Zinchenko mean? Zinchenko's starting. It's not going to be Kivior. He hasn't got to start for a few games. Tommy mm-hmm. Asu isn't ready. So you, you could look at either any one of those decisions and say, oh well, maybe it's it's a no. <laughs> when you look at all of those. He started his 11 because he wants those understandings. He wants it bedded in. Those guys are all starting unless there's a niggle during the week. Um, that, like Now, I will dial it back that like it wouldn't be the first time I was completely and utterly uh, you know, way off the... But I just burn. don't know how you, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how you can look at it and say he wasn't trying to work out how these guys are going to play. And why was he trying to work it out? Because Gabriel Jesus at left wing um, is is new to this setup with Havertz, with Rice, with, you know, he wants it to not just to have been something he did once or twice before. He wants it to be good. And he wants to make sure it works with Zinchenko in there. That's what this was all about. I, astounding. But... Like, you know, it is fascinating that we have these different fields for what may happen. And I just can't, I, I can't unsee this. The, like every choice was made with Bayern in my mind, no rotation. That's, that was what I took out of it. Clive, your thoughts on that and final thoughts on the lineup in the game? And that's, dear listener, is why I don't do first 11 debates. <laughs> 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 because, uh, and because I just I almost don't care I, I, I do care that we've got the right group of players that we can do different things with because um, but I think Paul's point of, uh, that, that is one point of view you cannot you can't argue against it's just it's just it could absolutely be it but I'm not worried because the game is 90 minutes and when someone's having a, a bad 10 minutes the first thing we all do is we look to the bench and think have you got somebody there to fix this <laughs> because not every game suits that individual, you know, and um, and when that individual is having a bad day and it just it's just not their game because the opponent they're playing against has got something they haven't got. Have you got the ability to change? 
And that's that's it. That's everything for me. A coach stands there when he turns around, and looks at his bench. If he sees things that are good, he's he's confident. And I look at Mikel Arteta in all the interviews; he looks really confident and really happy about the group that he has and the collective spirit. And he mentioned something earlier about the Gabriel block, and he said the way all the players reacted. But what he said was, "That's nothing to do with me or the coaches. That's them." Mm. And I love that because. For anyone who's played the game or been near the game, quite close to the game, I guarantee you the best moments you've had in football were the ones when you had the best dressing rooms. And that's the only thing that matters. And if that dressing room is what we think it is, you've got a real chance, mate, to keep this going. Yeah. Real chance. And, and by the way, I, it's not that I disagree with you, Paul, on, on whether that'll be the lineup. It was just the way that you were like, there's literally no other possibility that could possibly be discussed. <laughs> it's the only one that makes sense, and everything else is completely stupid. Oh, and it's I, like, I, I, swear I, to I want God. to leave the door a crack. You know? <laughs> when when that team sheet comes out, Paul's going to get about 4,000 messages on a hot Tuesday night. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. tell you, that's part of the fun. See, Can't it's, wait it's for not- that. You always should back your opinion, but you should also be thoughtful about your mentions. That's that's kind of how I look at things. Um, yeah, I, I'll be honest. I, I wouldn't be surprised if this was the lineup, obviously, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Martinelli came back in. Um, but we'll just have to see. And I, 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 I think I would be surprised at this point if Jorginho dropped out. I, I just think don't he's played so to. well. Yeah, I don't expect, don't expect him to either. To. He, may, he, he may do an hour. Point. He may do an hour, right? Yeah. And, and so what? Yeah, see, honestly, yeah. so what? It's not. It's, it isn't important. The good thing is he's playing pretty well, isn't he? He's playing pretty well. Yeah, it is a monumental. What, what clear. Can, can I say on that? What is clear is he wasn't thinking. Ooh, who knew? Does I need? Who who needs a rest? Right? He wasn't thinking. Oh, Saka, he needs a rest. Oh, Jorginho, he doesn't play two games in a row. Um, he wasn't thinking rest. So what was he thinking? So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's fair. I mean. I totally agree with that. I would just say that it was it was not a fixture where you can be thinking about Bayern, and the team clearly wasn't. I think that also, by the way, shows yeah. the professionalism of this group, that they focused on the task at hand. Now they'll focus on this one. It is a monumental night for our club, a monumental night for the Emirates. It will be loud. It will be special. It will be nervy. But I think, I think it is a challenge we are ready to take on. If we are as good as the data suggests, as our eyes suggest, if we are as good as we believe, this is the stage we want to be on. And I think we will perform on that stage. And I cannot wait to see it on a dodgy stream on my phone from vacation. What have I done? I'm staring at five recordings to piece together. So I better go and get that done. Please give to our fundraiser, help us get to our goal. Um, As I have heard, the club are really noticing and appreciating what you're doing. And I think we're going to be hearing from them on that front as well. So um, get your... Get your good karma in ahead of ahead of the Bayern game. We'll have an instant reaction right at full time of that one and so much stuff for you this week. Um, and you won't even have to hear from me, so it'll be even better. So we'll leave it there. Pause on Twitter. Pause my pants. Thanks. Pause. Caught him on mute. Caught him when he wasn't ready. Ooh. That's what you got to do. Bloody, yeah. bloody <laughs> but I hit it like four times. Give, give me the woohoo, please. Woohoo! Clive's on Twitter, Clive PFC. Uh, thank you, Clive. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> My name's Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. We love you, and we will talk to you after Arsenal 10 by our nil. No.